In the midst of fall 2020, anime fans were doing well with the release of some amazing titles, such as Jose, the Tiger and the Fish, and the box office godsend Demon Slayer Mugen Train. However, these are simply the movie releases of fall 2020. The reason I chose to mention those is because all the TV series airing during that time were considered irrelevant thanks to the arrival of a singular anime that would go on to take the world by storm. And that very anime is today's topic. Today in Let's Talk, Jujutsu Kaisen. Jujutsu Kaisen. If you're an anime fan, parent or friend of an anime fan, then you've definitely heard of this title. First a manga released by Gigi Akatami, then adapted to a series by anime workhouse I mean powerhouse Studio Mappa, has gone on to become the shonen gem of the recent years. After two seasons and a movie, its worldwide popularity has come to the point it rivals that of even Demon Slayer. So how has it gotten to such popularity in the first place? It could be many things, the smooth and beautiful animation, the godly choreography, the mind-blowing soundtrack, or even the story- Yeah, no, it's definitely because of him. Shonen are already capturing the hearts of many anime fans, and yet, Jujutsu Kaisen in particular is shaking the entire internet every time a new episode drops. The reason? It's been giving us moments that leave us in our seats with our mouths dropped and pants wetted. No? Just me? Okay, whatever then. Okay, okay. I've been getting ahead of myself here, so let's take it back a step. You must already know this. We all do. But my legal advisor requires me to put this in the video, so let me answer this. What even is Jujutsu Kaisen? Jujutsu Kaisen is the power fantasy following the life of a boy called Itadori Yuji with the physical capabilities of taking the infinity gauntlet from Thanos like it's taking candy from a baby. Seriously, the dude makes me feel like a worm. But don't worry, that's only his physical capabilities. After eating the special grade cursed object, the finger of the king of frauds himself, Ryomen Sukuna, Yuji finds himself roped into a whole new realm of combat, Jujutsu which is built entirely upon the spiritual energy chakra, I mean, cursed energy. Now you think of them going down the same path as other action series do. A kid eats something gross and ends up becoming the strongest hero ever. Wrong. Take those expectations and step back because you need to make way for the ladies man Gojo Satoru, as he makes his way in to show who the real strongest is. Jujutsu Kaisen isn't your normal shonen. It doesn't follow the path of a hero, it follows the path of a Jujutsu Sorcerer and the story makes it very clear these are nowhere near the same thing. Naruto, for example, whose demon nesting within becomes more supportive and even a friend to the boy, lives the life of a hero. Our protagonist Yuji is not given the same privilege. We're taught early and continuously that Sukuna is not our friend. He is, and always will be, a curse. And whether it's cursed users or cursed spirits, someone will be around the corner to torment our main character. That's why, in his journey to destroy the thousand year old menace to society, he managed to continue fighting thanks to the support of his allies, such as the gloomy and stoic character Fushiguro Megami, the relaxed and strongest character Gojo Satoru, and the female character Akatomi had to add to make a classic shonen trio, Kugisaki Nobara. Now, while all these characters are important in their own way, and play a major role in the story's popularity, I'm not here to talk about them. Wait, wait, don't click off. Just, just wait because I'm here to talk about the real important character in this series. Toto Aoi is unironically one of, if not, the best character Jujutsu Kaisen has to offer. He exists in an entirely different league of his own. He isn't here to give you some soppy backstory or question the current state of the world. He is here to know what type of girl you like. If he hates your answer, he'll beat the crap out of you. If he likes your answer, he'll beat the crap out of you. Originally he was some comic relief weirdo, but he ends up giving me a fight scene that restored all my happiness back in the season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen, blissfully ignoring the slaughter fest of the previous two episodes. But on a serious note, the characters of this series are very much split in that regard. Some of them follow the regular shonen standards where they have some backstory you have to care about, or they have someone they love, 
or they're just getting some midlife crisis and why they hate monkeys. Then there are characters like Toto, who have idols on their mind 24-7, ones who speak in little rice bowl ingredients, and then a goddamn panda. Just... just a panda. This is not necessarily a bad thing considering Jujutsu Kaisen likes to incorporate a decent amount of comedy to whatever it does, but this is also not up everyone's alley. Power fantasy humor is very hit or miss. Sometimes it can make you laugh, but other times it's just a pain to watch. Jujutsu Kaisen's comedic aspects were always more enjoyable to watch when they are presented more naturally, instead of just incorporating the silliest things ever at random moments. A very good example of this is in the first arc of the most recent season, the Hidden Inventory arc, which shows us the necessary sensei backstory every shonen needs to let us see why they're so strong in the first place. But what it also shows us is the most genuine friendship and bond I've seen in the series, which is between Gojo and Ghetto. The way the voice actors brought out their characters, the way the lines flowed, it genuinely felt like two best friends. We were teased since the Pariko movie, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, about the relationship between both the characters, as all we saw of them was the hero and the villain. But with the hidden inventory arc, that ended up being so much more, showing us two friends, who existed as the strongest of their league, until they got humbled. Well, one was definitely humbled harder than the other. Unfortunately, this is the only friendship bond I wanted to comment on, because they're the only two I was invested in during the entire series. Jujutsu Kaisen has lots of characters, with some of them being actually fleshed out and enjoyable to watch, and then there's the other characters who weren't as much. They all range a lot, there's the strong and the weak, the funny and the unfunny, the insane and sane. It gives you quite a large cast of characters that you'd find enjoyable in some form, but with a cast as large and diverse as this, you're bound to find a few you just don't like at all either. I know I've been ranting about the characters a lot now, but it's for good reason. They're the major selling point of the series. People are finally excited to see some female characters that weren't just used as character development for others, but instead, they were actually shown to be strong. That the female characters weren't just some weak throwaways or used as love interests for the protagonist, they showed us that they were their own character and epic as hell. That was something I was glad the series did well, as the story itself is probably the weakest aspect. And that came out a lot more harsh than intended, but it's unfortunately true. The story of Jujutsu Kaisen is pretty basic, and let's be honest here, it was to be expected. I didn't go into this anime expecting a revolutionary story that was going to make my world go upside down, such as the likes of Steins Gate and Attack on Titan, and you didn't either. And if you did, then sorry to disappoint. Jujutsu Kaisen is a simple story that isn't driven by development, but instead, intense action. The only arc I've seen in this series that was more story driven by the characters and action was the first of the two arcs in Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. That's right folks, I'm finally getting to the actual topic of this video. The rant about hating the characters is finally over. Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 was definitely the most anticipated anime of 2023, after fans had received and very much loved the first season and the movie. They were about to receive an arc dedicated to the biggest fan favorite himself, who managed to create a simp fan base that rivals that of even Levi and Osamu Dazai. You'd think an arc like that would gain the most attraction and hype, however, that was not true at all. The hype for Hidden Inventory was there, but was irrelevant in comparison to the second arc that would follow it. The arc that manga readers have been hyping up to be the next coming of Christ since the anime started airing. That's right, you know what I'm talking about, the Shibuya Incident. The Shibuya Incident is the arc that everything before has been leading up to, and that everyone on the internet has been treating as the godfather of shounen arcs. The big clash between the cursed spirits and the sorcerers. Lots of people consider the Shibuya incident as the part where Jujutsu Kaisen goes from a classic shonen to being leagues above all the others. But I disagree. The Shibuya incident is simply the big battle you'd see in many other battle shonen. Except, one thing it did was it actually managed to incorporate everything you'd expect for a big battle and pull it off while still retaining the hype. We got insane plot twists, hype fight sequences, incredible power-ups, and no victories? There is a reason this arc is called the Shibuya Incident and not the Shibuya Battle. It was an absolute bloodfest. It kicks off with the sealing of Gojo Satoru in order to make this entire thing even fair. As of course, Gojo had to be made too powerful for his own good and therefore the prison realm had to be pulled for Akatami's butt in order to seal him away for this arc to take place. Of course, with him being Gojo, he doesn't make his leave without slaughtering a helpless plant and then suffering intense PTSD from the return of his quote unquote best friend. It really isn't funny when it's your friend this time, is it Gojo? 
However, this is just the event that kicks off the incident, with the sealing of Gojo Sataru and the reveal of our true villain turning out not to be Ghetto Suguru, but the evil sorcerer of a hundred years ago, Noritoshi Kamo. A lot of the things that were done well as plot points that were revealed in Shibuya had already been teased long ago, with the death of Ghetto Suguru, the existence of an evil sorcerer from years ago, and Megami many times almost summoning 8-handled sword divergent Jigema Jigema Goku no Surike, Kaijari Suigo no Suigo Matsu, Furnai Matsu, Furamatsu, Kunara Takoroni, Sumo Takoro, Yabura Koji no, Uro Koji, Haipo Papo, Haipo no Shurigan, Shurigan no Bugurinai, Gurindai no, Omo Gofino, Omo Gokuan no, Chokyo Mie no, Kyosuke no Mahoraga. This entire arc is Akatami repeatedly kicking out main character in the privates of 16 straight episodes. The sealing of his teacher, the brutal deaths of Nanami and Nobra by the hands of Mahito, and the icing on the cake, the mass murder of the citizens of Shibuya at the hands of himself. Well, not exactly. With the unleashment of Ryom and Sukuna into Shibuya, we got to witness two straight bite scenes that weren't even bite scenes. They were straight up mass destruction. From meteors and lava swallowing the city, to the point that Sukuna himself cooks the entire city to the ground at the hands of Malevolent Kitchen. And of course, our main character has to suffer through all these things within the time span of a couple hours. And even then, the Shibuya incident is lost as Noritoshi Kamo and Urame flee the scene with the prison realm, leaving the entire 23 wards of Tokyo to become a hell of 10 million cursed spirits. Now, while the overarching battle was terribly lost, that doesn't mean the individual fights themselves were terrible. They were goddamn epic. From the slaughter fest of Sukuna's battles against Maharaga and Jogo, and even the insane battle of two brothers between Yuji and Choso. But, there's one particular battle that sets us up apart from all the others. The battle against Mahito. This was without a doubt, the most important battle of this entire arc. Which is why I was safe for last. Mahito has been a pain in Yuji's brain and butt since his first proper mission with Nanami, as he saw his new friend Yoshino Junpei die by his hands. Literally. And not only that, just before their fight, he had to watch not only Nanami, but also Nobara be transmutated and die before his eyes one after another. And to top it off, get hit by a black flash that blessed Yuji in the past several times. This battle was personal. On the arrival of Toto, Yuji regained his spirit and set out to fight Mahito in a battle of two against one. We got to see insane choreography, unleashment of black flashes, crazy abilities, and even a goddamn idol sequence. And to top it off, the voice acting which managed to make my heart pound. I've been in a terrible mood with this season due to the art looking like ping pong and the real world working conditions of MAPA, but the Mahito fired me enjoying the season once more. This wasn't a fight that was won by plot convenience such as Toji invading the Dagon fight, but this fight was won based on the pure skill of our two sorcerers. The whole premise of this fight was the growth of Yuji and Mahito. Each of them had already gotten stronger since their last confrontation, but they still continued to grow in their fight. Mahito expanded his techniques to new heights, and Yuji grew his mentality to the point where he no longer needed a reason to kill Mahito. He would kill him just because he can. This ended up being a fight that was not only a visual feast, but ended up being a fight that challenged our protagonists physically and philosophically. Mahito, the true embodiment of a curse. And Yuji, a man who has now accepted his role as a cog in the system of sorcerers. This was no longer a battle of grudges, but a battle of ideologies. It became a battle to determine who would be left standing in a thousand years from now. The curses or the humans? This was the deciding factor. And it's those very ideologies that let Yuji finally get the goddamn W he deserves. And for us, the viewers, we obtain a sense of euphoria never thought possible. Not even the ending of school days provided me with such happiness as seeing Maito crying like a little baby. It was the perfect conclusion to his character. This guy, that repeatedly annoyed the hell out of us all ever since he was introduced, was finally getting the miserable and pathetic death he deserved. Which moves us on to... Noritoshi Kamo. Since the beginning of this arc, he has been surrounded by mystery since we did see Geno die in Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. So how on earth is he still here? The beginning of Shibuya gave us the answer with Gojo realizing his best friend was an imposter. But even still, while there are many mysteries still standing with this character, one thing we do know is he is the most evil sorcerer to ever exist. On the conclusion of Shibuya, 
Noritoshi Kama using Idol Transfiguration to awaken several incarnated sorcerers and modern sorcerers for a battle to the death gave us a near perfect ending to this arc. From the beginning, the Shibuya incident was designed for the villains. Even the opening itself was unlike all the others, and a complete contrast to the previous one of that season. Kai Kai Katan, Vivid Vice, and Aono Sumika gave us hope and hype for our protagonists. However, specials was very much different. The darker theme, alongside a glow of red, throughout the opening showed us the carnage the villains would cause us in this season. It was literally filled to the brim with spoilers that manga readers were having PTSD from whenever each episode started playing. And not only that, the literal contrast of the appearances of our heroes and villains in this opening was outstanding. The villains are having the time of their lives, meanwhile Gojo looks like he just saw a ghost. Oh wait. And now, with the season fully over, we're left with massive cliffhangers and even the return of a man who could have single-handedly stopped the Shibuya incident if he wasn't feeding the giraffes in Africa. All we can do now is wait for the arrival of the next season of Jujutsu Kaisen, Shimetsu Kaiyu, aka The Culling Games. However, Mappa, please, I beg of you, let the animators rest. I'll be very happy if we don't get this season for another 5 years, just don't create another season based on a literal hellish environment that also somehow produced an entire movie in four months. Alright, that was a bit of a downer ending. To finish off, I do believe Jujutsu Kaisen is and will be a shonen gem for quite some time, whether it is a good or bad anime, until the next big thing arrives. Battle shonen are all taking a moment in the spotlight until they reach their peak of popularity, such as Fulminate Alchemist and Demon Slayer. But that's gonna be it for me, folks. I'm Tenshi, and this was Jujutsu Kaisen. Mata ne mina.